Our first question from Facebook is from Solomon. Death makes me think about what I want to leave behind when I go. How can we honor and enjoy our lives while making sure we won't burden our loved ones with our stuff later? Now, Zach, it is true that your coffin does not come equipped with a hitch for a (laughs) U-Haul. Oh, my patent pending. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and 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 yet we live our lives like um like it does. There's a book that came out maybe 3 or 4 years ago called The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. I'm sure some of you have heard of Swedish death cleaning, but it is essentially preparing your stuff for your death in a way. Or actually a better way is preparing to not burden the people in your life with this excess stuff. This whole thing with when minimalism started for me and Ryan, I had to go down to Florida to deal with my mom's stuff. I'd been down there a bunch of times while she was going through chemo and radiation, which, by the way, talk about prolonging suffering. I mean, it was one of the worst things that she could have done. She had stage four cancer, eventually reached her brain, and they were just trying to prolong a life in which she would suffer more at some point. And uh, with this tiny sliver of hope that maybe I'll, you know, survive this or, or whatever it was, right? But then the last time I went down there, it was to deal with her stuff. And the average American household has 300,000 items in it. And I found this out firsthand in my mom's tiny one-bedroom apartment. And she, it's not like she was a conventional hoarder. She just had a lot of stuff. She had 65 years worth of accumulations. And so the big antique furniture and the big bed here and the cups and plates and bowls and her towel closet and the makeup chest and all of these different things that we accumulate over time. And we don't think about, okay, I'm not using these things, but we hold on to it just in case. Three most dangerous words in the English language. And then what happens? Eventually when we die, someone else now has to deal with those things. And it's really difficult It's the hardest thing to do is like this person just left and now everything has some sort of, it's infused with this sentimental value, or at least we think it is. It's a story we tell ourselves. Oh, I better hold on to this. This is precious. This is precious. This is precious. But of course, if everything's precious, nothing is precious. And I started letting go of my mom's stuff, realizing that I could let go of it because the memories aren't in the things. The memories are inside us. Mm -hmm. And so I could let go of the things and still maintain the memories of my mother. Now, Zach, I've heard you Mm -hmm. say this and you've alluded to it here. I'm just really fascinated by this, that the memories that we have are in the water, in our cells. And I've never heard anyone really talk about that. Maybe you could clarify that a bit for Mm -hmm. us. I point out that if you're a pharaoh, you do get to have the U-Haul hitch. And you, <laughs> you get to bring it all. You can bring it all down in that sarcophagus. And I'm like, this is, this or we can start burying people in storage pots. Yeah, I think that's actually the simplest approach, obviously, for the dealing with the stuff left behind. Zach and I are starting a business. Yeah, we all yeah, get a pyramid. Yeah, yeah, U-Haul bearing. Yeah, yeah. For, forget about the coffin. We're just going to go with the 60-foot U-Haul. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah, no, it's... Um, the stuff that we accumulate is, you know, symptomatic of a life lived in in a in the finite reality, you know, mm. and so we have this opportunity, I think, to when you're writing your living will, start to look at the way you're living and see if you you are alive, you know, just do mm. a quick check in, of like, am I actually here? Mm. Because if you're writing a, if you've got seventy two pages in your living will of stuff and where it needs to go, you can just kind of ponder, perhaps, like, wow, do I. A, do I want my my loved ones to deal with that when I'm done? And B, do I want to deal with that for the next 50 years, you know? Yeah. And so I think there's this huge opportunity to live ready to die. And I love that so much that it's like my my massive transformative purpose. I am the storm. I'm ready to die again today. Mm. I love the energetics of being vital. I love the energy of being alive. I love the way in which being alive is so ethereal like like a storm is. And yet I love that it's only in letting go of everything that you've experienced today that you get to keep living. Because the moment you make today the thing, tomorrow is going to be heavier. And so this willingness to die to yourself and to everything you experience today on the pillow every night is a very powerful tool towards joy. Wow. And I have to, I'm, I've been on a 12-year journey of just 
extreme deconstruction of stuff around me, you know, my relationship expectations on self as a father, as a husband, as this or that, you know, letting all of these these roles go to be more and more the expression of me. And in that, it's just been this, you know, journey of starting to feel joyful at a level that I didn't know was possible for the first, you know, 45 years. And so in these last five years, just starting to feel alive and starting to think, you know, in these next 50 years, if I'm willing to die every night on that pillow and wake up fresher and more clear from the burden of the water crystals that we'll go into in a minute, I'm going to be vibrationally ecstatic. And that's ultimately the description that I would say is what does it mean to be alive? It means that you are capable of being vibrationally ecstatic. And that ecstasy can take on incredible stillness. It's not like ecstatic, like bouncing around, like, I'm so happy. I'm the happiest person in the room. I'm going to go shake everybody until they're happy. (laughs) It's more of this sense of vibrational presence and for me i like what harkens to mind is the the sound of a blue whale in the ocean these long deep vibrations that actually can travel the circumference of the earth five times a single call of a blue whale five times around the circumference of the oceans and so that's what it feels like to be vibrationally ecstatic is it can be heard five times around the world because you are so clean in your vibration and so pure in that essence. But to do it, you're going to have to let go and let go and let go and let go. And so are you ready to die again? So let's go into the water structure that you asked about. A storm is so cool to me and I love it as a sense of identity because uh, ultimately, a storm is nothing, right? It's it's not the rain. It's not the wind. That wind is wind. The rain is rain. It's not the hail. It's not the lightning because lightning is lightning. So what the hell mm. is the storm? Mm. The storm is this center point that, like a conductor in an orchestra, spins these energies to play a symphonic expression of beauty. And that beauty is destructive, anything that was before so that it can create such a fresh canvas for this morning's dawn and the smell of wet earth and the feeling of fresh breeze on your skin when it's been cleansed through the rain. The storm is nothing, but it creates everything. And that's what I think it means to be living. Are you capable of being nothing so that you can take the beauty of the essence of everything around you and spin it into such a vibrational experience that it would erase the past and you would be only present in the beauty today. That's an exciting way to live life. Are you willing to be nothing so that you can be witness to everything? Did you enjoy this standalone Patreon highlight? If so, you can listen to full episodes of The Minimalist's private podcast available exclusively on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash The Minimalists or click the link in the description. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free.